Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. So glad you've chosen to worship with us today as we continue in our sermon series on the seven deadly sins. Today we're looking at what is probably the least understood sin of the seven. We're going to be looking at the sin of sloth. And to guide our thinking, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. If you do not own a Bible, please accept that as our gift to you. Nehemiah is in about the middle of the Old Testament. You can go ahead and turn there to chapter 1. We'll be reading selected passages throughout the book. I suppose there are several reasons why the sin of sloth is misunderstood. For one thing, that, that's not a word that we use very often these days. It's just not typically a part of our vocabulary to talk about sloth or slothfulness. And on the rare occasion we do use that word, the contemporary meaning is uh, far different from what the early church fathers had in mind 1,700 years ago when they drew up this list of the seven deadly sins. Uh, When they included the sin of sloth, uh, you rest assured they certainly did not have a three-toed mammal that inhabits the rainforests of Central and South America in mind. But neither were they talking about just plain old laziness. I think that's typically what we are referring to when we use the word laziness. But laziness, in fact, is a component of sloth. It's one of the symptoms of sloth sloth, as we're going to see in just a few moments. Sometimes we think it's a reference to depression, but that's not true either. You see, sloth is a sin, and there's nothing sinful about depression. You know, sin is an act of the will. It's, it, it's a volitional thing. It's something that we choose to do. No sane person ever chose to be depressed. Depression is an affliction. So what is it then? If if we tend to have it wrong, what were the early church fathers getting at? Well, it's actually a combination of several behaviors and attitudes. I'm thinking primarily of apathy, cynicism, and laziness. Now, any of the three on their own are bad enough, but when you put them together, Together, when those three things come together in a person's life, you have moved into some dangerous territory. You have stepped over the line into sin when these three things are operative in your life. Dorothy Sayers, one of my favorite writers, was a contemporary and a friend of C.S. Lewis. She defined sloth this way. It is not merely idleness of mind and laziness of body. It is that whole poisoning of the will, which, beginning with indifference and an attitude of I couldn't care less, extends to the deliberate refusal of joy and culminates in morbid introspection and despair. It is the sin which believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and only remains alive because there is nothing it would die for. Strong words. Understood properly, sloth ain't a pretty thing. But some, I think, call into question whether or not it actually reaches the level of sinfulness. I mean, come on, Pastor Dan. You know, lust, oh, sure, obviously. Greed, yeah. That, but not caring? I mean, really, you, 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 you're going to call that sin? Not only are you going to do that, but you're going to put it like among the seven deadly? Well, yes, absolutely, we are. And here's why. <laughs> because sloth is the polar opposite of love. Some people think that hate is the opposite of love, but hate reveals at least a vestige of emotion. You you care enough about the person or the situation to hate, 
But when we are in a state of slothfulness, there is no care, there is no compassion, there's no concern. It is rife with apathy, with indifference, with a complete unwillingness to engage. Far worse than hatred is to just not care at all. You might as well say to the person or the issue or whatever it is, you don't even exist. That's how little I am concerned or I care about this situation. And left untended, sloth can become like a cancer in our lives. It's not just a spiritual matter, so to speak. It's not only concerned with church life or our relationship with God. No, it very easily seeps over into every area of our lives. Before you know it, we're being slothful in our marriages. The things that used to concern us, the things that we used to care about, namely the well-being of our spouse, suddenly is taking a back seat over and over. Our families, the responsibility that we have to our children to raise them, to teach them, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to get them ready for life, suddenly that just not worth the bother. Careers, friendships, you name it. There is no area of life that is immune from the impact of sloth. And therefore, it is imperative that as Christ followers, we recognize it and we address it and we address it forcefully. So where does this thing come from anyway? Well, it doesn't come overnight. It's not as though anybody woke up one day and decided, I, today I think I'll be a sloth. No, it's one of those sins, one of those conditions that we slowly step into one step at a time. But it begins, its, its origin is in a disconnect from God. That's the first step. When suddenly the things of God, our love for God, our passion for God, it's as though we have pulled the plug on that. And the thought of, of being in the word or being a person of prayer, that's not a priority anymore. Other things are beginning <laughs> to take a priority. And the thought of being with God's people on any sort of regular basis, whether it's in church or in a grow group, that becomes distasteful. A cynicism about other people's faith, the sincerity of their faith begins to creep in. We're doubting them. We even begin to doubt the sincerity of our own faith. And again, this doesn't happen overnight. This is a very slow-moving sort of thing. And I've noticed over the years that there is a particular season in life when we are more apt to fall into sloth than any other. And it is the season of empty nesting. I've seen it. I, I, I first noticed it when I was a kid in my home church. And I've witnessed it in every church that I have been a part of since then. It goes like this. Mom and dad are passionate about church because that's what they think the kids need. It's comparative to baseball or ballet. You know, as long as they're into baseball, we're into baseball. As long as they're into ballet, we're into ballet. And we're sort of living vicariously through their interests. And church, you know, that's an important thing. And we got to get them the, you know, the basic Bible stories and all that. Get them ready for life. So during the child rearing years, we're there. But then I've seen it happen time and again. The kids graduate and mom and dad graduate as well from church. And the shame of it all is that that is the season in life when we are positioned to make the greatest contribution to the kingdom that we possibly can. And I'm not just talking about a financial contribution. I'm talking about the whole person. I mean, think about it. You're finally free from those life-sucking leeches that have been <laughs> just drawing it from you for years and years. You've got energy to give. You've got brain cells to share. Seriously, you've probably, probably got more wisdom than at any previous time in your life just by virtue of bringing up children 
And chances are you probably are uh, financially better positioned than at any other time. It is the season, the prime of life when men and women can step into the fullness of what it is that God is calling them to do. But far too often, I see the kids leave and then I see the parents leave. And I point to sloth. What was there really in the first place? The reason I know that the starting place is is a disconnect from God is because there is nothing apathetic, cynical, or lazy about God. Nothing. Our God is creative, enthusiastic, energized, full of compassion and care. And we see this no more clearly than in Jesus. Jesus, who came to reveal to us the Father, was the most compassionate, caring, loving person who ever lived. There was not an apathetic, cynical, lazy bone in his body. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. He didn't say, I've come that you might all be sloths. No, Jesus came to show us what life can be, what the Father has created us for, what he is calling us to. And there is no such thing as a slothful Christ follower. It's an oxymoron. The two do not go together. So what do we do about it? How can we either get out of it if we find ourselves in that place or avoid it? Better yet, altogether, just avoid going there to begin with. Well, to guide our thinking, we're going to be looking at the prophet Nehemiah. Several very important lessons we can learn from Nehemiah's life in order to avoid or get out of the sin of sloth. And the principles that we're going to talk about fall under a very broad category, what I'll call the antidote to sloth. And it's this, the antidote to sloth is to discover and to live out God's vision for your life. To discover and to live out God's vision for your life. You may not be aware that God has something in mind specific for you. He has some very definite thoughts about how you should live your life. And I'm not just talking about your behavior, your moral behavior, I'm talking about what you do with your life. What is it gonna add up to in the end? What will you have accomplished? What will your life count for? God has a plan for that. And as we get in touch with that plan, as we discover that plan, we suddenly discover that there is an energy for living and a deep well of compassion and caring that can't come from any other place. But it's something that we have to pursue. It's something that we have to go after. God is not going to force feed us his vision. He's not going to demand it of us, no. God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. I think that's exactly what Jesus was talking about when he said, all who ask, receive. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, the door is open. Those are all active verbs there where Jesus is communicating. If you really want what God has for you, ask for it. Seek it. Knock on the door. And the door will be opened, he says. All who ask, receive. All who seek, find. And all who knock, find that the door will be opened. God not only has a vision for your life, he is more eager for you to take it than you are to look for it. I think God is calling us today to re-examine our lives and ask, do I even know what God's vision for my life is? Have I ever thought about pursuing it, understanding it, discovering it, much less implementing it, allowing God to do in and through me what he can only do in and through me? 
The reason I am a unique, different creation is because he has something specific in mind for me. Well, we're going to see how this plays out in the life of Nehemiah. Three principles in particular I would lift up to you from Nehemiah's life about discovering and implementing, living out God's vision for your life. And the first of those principles is this. When we get a hold of God's vision, or when it gets a hold of us, perhaps better said, we begin to see life differently. We see life differently. We begin to see things that we didn't see before, or the familiar takes on a completely new appearance. We suddenly begin to notice things that we had not noticed before. (coughs) Nehemiah was an Israelite who had never been to Israel. That's because 140 years before his time, the nation of Israel had been destroyed and the capital city of Jerusalem burned to the ground and the walls (laughs) demolished. And most of those who survived the destruction were hauled off into slavery, into exile. And Nehemiah was a descendant of those first exiles. He was a slave in the kingdom of Persia. He was actually a personal slave to King Artaxerxes, at that time the most powerful man in the world. And his job as a slave was to be the cupbearer. That is to say, he was the food taster, the one who got to make sure the food was not poisoned. Now, if anybody in the world had reason to feel or be slothful, it was Nehemiah. I mean, think about it. He is a slave, hopelessly so. There is no possibility whatsoever of gaining his freedom. And he's just spending day after day after day after day waiting until that final spoonful puts him in the grave, and somebody else comes and takes his place. How depressing. That would be enough to push anybody toward sloth. But God had something in mind for Nehemiah. God was about to invade his life and impart to him a vision that would not only change Nehemiah's life, it would change the course of history. One day... Nehemiah ran into a couple of Jews who had actually been to Jerusalem recently and were passing through Persia. And so he was eager to hear what has gone on there. And in chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, we read these words. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. There was something about that news, even though he had never been there, something about the news of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem that drove Nehemiah to his knees. (laughs) And we're going to see that in that season of prayer, God began to put an idea in his mind, a passion in his heart that otherwise would have been unthinkable. And the idea was this, to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city walls. In February of 2006, 14 years ago, I don't remember the exact day, but I do remember the month I woke up one morning to have my devotions, and the reading was from Luke chapter 4. And if you're familiar with that chapter, you know that it's a description of Jesus standing up in his hometown in the synagogue, reading from the Old Testament. 
And in the reading of this passage, he is proclaiming to his listeners, this is why I have come. This is who I am, and this is what I am going to be doing. These are the words that he said. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I had read that passage literally hundreds of times before that day. But for some reason, on that morning, those words leapt off the page and into my heart. And for the first time, I thought to myself, God, are, is there something that you want me to do here? I mean, every other reading had just been an understanding of what Jesus was about. But suddenly, for the first time, it felt personalized. It felt as though God was saying, I want you to go to the poor. And I want you to go to those who are in prison. And I want you to set the captive free, Dan planted the seed in my mind. And so as the months roll by, I'm trying to understand this, and I kid you not, I could not turn around without bumping into Luke chapter 4. Driving down 1960, there's a billboard, Luke 4. <laughs> turn on KSBJ, today's devotional is from Luke chapter 4. Pastor Ken preached a sermon from Luke chapter 4. I went to two conferences that year, one in Chicago and one in L.A., and the keynote speakers, both conferences, you know what their text was? Luke chapter 4. Okay, okay, your speak, Lord, what could it be? And as I prayed and asked God to reveal to me, what are you doing here? A seed of an idea landed in my heart. Dan? I want you to be the missions pastor at Faith Bridge. Uh, well, Lord, I'm the care pastor. That's why they pay me. And I don't get to decide entirely. You know, I have a boss. And, and besides, missions was not happening much at Faith Bridge. We, there, I think we were contributing somewhere around $40,000 a year to various mission efforts. The, the position of missions pastor had been vacant for two years. But I couldn't get away from this nagging feeling, Dan, I want you to do this. Well, vision not only opens our eyes and helps us see things that we hadn't seen before. Vision also, principle number two, enables us to take action. It enables us to take action. It gives us courage. It gives us enthusiasm for taking action. In chapter two of Nehemiah, we read that one day he walked into Artaxerxes' throne room to serve the meal as he typically did, but he must have been very focused on this problem back in Jerusalem because Artaxerxes said, Nehemiah, what's wrong? Why the long face? Well, Nehemiah had been praying. Chapter 1, he very specifically prayed, Lord, if you want me to do this, you've got to give me favor with the king. And so when Artaxerxes asked him, what's the matter? Man, he went for it. He said, well, since you've asked. You know, I'm a Jew. And the most precious city in the world to us Jews is Jerusalem. And it is practically torn and burned down. And I was just wondering, could you see your way to letting me go free, to travel a thousand miles, to repair the city walls, and while you're at it, would you provide a retinue of soldiers to give me protection in my passage? And would you also consider paying for all of the construction costs when I get there? How incredibly impertinent can you be? I mean, Artaxerxes would have been well within his right to say, who do you think you are? Out of here. But to his everlasting joy and surprise... Artaxerxes said, I think we can do that. 
Matter of fact, I'm sure we can. Let's do it. There's no turning back then. The vision had come, and now things are in motion. And he knows he has to act. He's received permission from the king. Well, the conviction about becoming the missions pastor here had been steadily growing on my heart for some six months. But I knew if I was going to step into that role, I was going to have to have the permission of the king. So I prayed and I made an appointment with Pastor Ken. (laughs) It was in August. We went out to dinner together one evening and I laid it all out for, you know, Luke chapter four, back in February, bumping into it everywhere I go, this growing burden, this passion, this vision. I just really feel like this is what God is calling me to do. And Ken sat back and like, well, uh, no. I said, what, what, wait, (laughs) that's not how it goes. You're supposed to say yes, and I'll send you soldiers to protect you. And you know, all the, he said, no. See my disappointment. He said, Dan, here's the thing. You're my care pastor and and you're a good care pastor. I need a good care pastor. If, If I move you to be the missions pastor, hire a new care pastor. And then six months later, you come back to me and say, hey, uh, about that missions pastor thing, um, I think I missed it. Said, I can't keep you on the payroll because you're my friend. Yeah, I, I think we ought to just leave things as they are. Let's just leave them well enough alone. Well, if I was gonna jump out of it, there was my opportunity But I knew that I knew that I knew God was doing something. And so I said, well, what if we were to put it to the test? He said, what do you mean? I said, would you be willing to give me one month, one month to pull together Faith Bridge's first missions campaign ever? And and we'll have two goals. The first goal will be to involve as many faith bridgers outside the walls of the church as we possibly can. And the second goal will be to raise as much money as we possibly can for missions. Certainly more than the 40,000 or so that we give. He said, that sounds reasonable. You take the month of September, do what you got to do, and I'll give you October as missions month. You got a deal. Well, Nehemiah learned that it's one thing to get permission, it's another thing to make it happen. And when he got to Jerusalem, with the retinue of soldiers and the funding and all the rest, he had to have been discouraged. The city walls at that time were approximately two miles in circumference. They had been pretty well destroyed 140 years earlier and neglected since. I mean, it was a mess. And we're not just talking about a, you know, drywall. These city walls were 40 feet tall and eight feet thick. Could ride two chariots across the top, two miles. But he was not deterred because he understood God had something for him to do. And so he went to work and he recruited leaders from within the city. And he went to neighborhoods and he said, okay, neighborhood, you're responsible for the section of the wall where you live. And this neighborhood, you're responsible for the wall where you live. And they went to work. And I mean, they worked night and day. Even in the midst of some persecution, there were some who did not want them to build that wall, but they kept at it. Nehemiah said, listen, I want you to have a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. And we're going to build this wall. And in chapter 6, verse 15, we read these words. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. 52 days. 
only God. Principle number three regarding vision. Vision gives us an opportunity to get out of the way and let God do what only God can do. God recruits us. He calls us into it. We are the agency. We're the vehicle. But when it comes right down to it, who's the one who's going to get it done? Through our obedience, God is going to make it happen. Repairing that wall in 52 days was humanly impossible, but with God, all things are possible. I had a month to get ready for this missions campaign. I had never put on a missions campaign in my life, but I recruited a group of leaders, a group of faith bridgers who were enthused and excited about missions. And we began to meet and plan and work and dream about what could be. And we came up with a campaign that we decided to call Taking It to the Streets. We even called the Doobie Brothers to see if they would come and sing the song <laughs> for us. They were too expensive, couldn't afford them. We got these really cool t-shirts for everybody to wear, and we found serve opportunities all over the city of Houston. And on the weekends and throughout the week, we were giving Faith Bridgers every opportunity to get outside and serve. And the culmination was going to be the last Sunday of October when we would have our first Faith Promise Sunday. I had never heard of a Faith Promise Sunday before this. But it's an opportunity for God's people to come together to understand the importance of missions and to say, you know what? I believe in this enough that over and above my regular giving, I'm going to commit this to missions and I'm going to trust by faith that God will provide it for me. Well, when the day was over, the month was over, and that last Sunday was over, the numbers were all tallied up. And I walked into Pastor Ken's office. I put it on his desk. I said, here's the results. He said, tell me what happened. I said, well, in October, we had 1,500 faith bridgers go outside the walls to serve in the city of Houston and today, Faith Bridge pledged $300,000 to the cause of mission in the world. And he said, congratulations, you're my new missions pastor. You're my new missions pastor, but you still have to be the care pastor. I could deal with that. Only God. I couldn't round up 1,500 people to do anything. I couldn't raise $300,000 if my life depended on it. But God can and God did. And yet, what he did that month pales in comparison to what he has done since then. Two years later, in 2008, two Faith Bridge members, David Raines and Tom Hargrove, came to me and said, we got to do something about the situation south of 1960. There's kids down there who are going home from school with nothing to eat. We can't have that five miles away. And they began to work and dream and plan and pray and drew in other Faith Bridgers. And that's how Bridging for Tomorrow was born. And today, Bridging for Tomorrow, our nonprofit, has an office down there, an operating budget of a half a million dollars and full-time staff of nine, and they are touching thousands of lives with the gospel. Two years later, Peggy Burden became our local outreach coordinator. And through Peggy's efforts and prayers and undying enthusiasm, we have fed thousands of hungry Houstonians, ministered to hundreds of single moms and foster kids and senior citizens and homeless and on and on and on the list goes. Pastor Ken became involved in an organization called the Houston Church Planning Network, an organization devoted to planting life-giving churches all over the city of Houston. And through our missionary efforts, we've been able to help plant four enthusiastic, exciting churches all over the city. Long about 2010, this kid by the name of Seth Martin showed up on our staff. He had hair back then. <laughs> Little did I know that God would use Seth to take our short-term missions program to a whole new level. I thought we were doing good if we had 100 adults go out on mission each summer. 
Seth implemented this thing called the road. And this summer, through the road, we're going to send out well over 400 kids and adults in short-term mission. In 14 years, we have provided seminary-level training for over 2,000 pastors and leaders all around the globe. And this year, our budget for missions is not $300,000. It is $1,300,000. And every single penny goes outside the walls of this church. Only God. That was an opportunity for me just to back up and get myself out of the way and let God do what only God could do. Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined a bridging for tomorrow and local outreach and short-term missions programs and on and on. But God knew all of that was coming. You know, at Faith Bridge, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that there's not too many folks here that are suffering from sloth. I, I, I don't see a whole lot of apathetic, cynical, lazy people here. But I tell you what does worry me. Sloth light. It's not the full-blown where you just don't even care, but it's sort of a low-grade passivity to the things of God and an unwillingness to engage with Him and learn, God, what do you want to do with me? Friends, that's why you're here on this planet because God has something for you to do. But the only way you're going to discover it is to draw near to God and open your mind and your heart to His vision and let Him do in and through you what only God can do. Perhaps the area where sloth light is occurring in your life isn't church. Maybe it, maybe it is your marriage. Maybe you need a new vision for you and your spouse. Maybe it's your home life and being a parent. Maybe it's your career. I don't know. But just as sloth can impact every area, God's vision can impact every area. And I don't think anything would be more pleasing to the heart of God than for his people at this place called Faith Bridge to turn their hearts toward him and in humility and in hunger say to him, Lord, here I am, send me. I'm open to your vision. In just a moment, I'm, I'm going to pray that prayer for us. But I, I don't want to stop there. Because I have a sense that God is dealing with people this morning. And if he's dealing with you, don't turn it off. Our altar is open. Come down here. Ready to receive what he has for you. Your life will never, ever be the same. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the incredible example of Nehemiah, a man who was willing to hear and respond and act. Thank you, God. Forgive us, Lord, for our passivity. Stir within us a hunger and a thirst a renewed desire to engage with you and learn why you've created us. Use us, I pray, oh God, for your good and perfect purposes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.